Deputy yeah. Sullivan, 10 yes. minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. We know that there has been an intense amount of attention on the housing situation in recent weeks. I mean, the technical group, we had a private member's motion on it at the end of April. We've had leaders questions, we've had topical issues, other questions, and a lot of media attention. And I think the one thing we have to agree on is that there is a crisis, and it's a, a crisis that is requiring prompt attention. So the people feel that there is a resolution coming. Now, I know the housing needed can't be built overnight, but I do think that if, we, if people see steps being taken, that they can feel confident that there will be a resolution, I think that could go a long way with the current um, controversy and the current difficulties. We know the facts and the figures and the statistics, and they are staggering on the extent of homelessness. And I think the picture of homelessness is also changing from the sad, stereotypical um, small minority, generally single men um, with mental health issues or addiction issues who have fallen on hard times. But the numbers of homeless now are very different. And what we see are we're bringing in people and families who in other times would never have ended up in a crisis situation. And we know that it's coming from the unemployment, from negative equity, and we know it's also coming from not sufficient funding to the local authorities and the housing agencies to fill those needs. Now, we've spoken on this before, and I've ident for me, I've identified them that with the local authority, they don't have enough housing to meet the demand. There's not a quick enough movement or prompt movement on the number of voids that we see in the constituency, and I see it all the time in Dublin Central. We know that with social housing, there was insufficient funding, and we do know that some of those who contracted to build social housing uh, or build housing did not fulfil the need or the regulation regarding the social housing aspect of it. And then in the private rented, we know the rising rents, rents and the other factors that are causing landlords to issue notices to quit, which is putting further pressure on the housing services. Now, I know organisations do their best to source emergency accommodation so that at least people are safe and they're warm and they have a roof over their head. But many times it's not suitable for families and we see them going into accommodation that is just not suitable. So, looking at the answers, well, one is the local authority having sufficient funding to make a difference, and that means funding for those voids. And it has to be seen to move now, and I know some money is available, but we need to see this moving very quickly because of the extent that we see there. And I'm looking at perfectly good accommodation boarded up. It's costly to board it up, and of course the longer it's left boarded up, the more expensive it is then when the, the builders or whoever come in to renovate and to restore. We also have the workforce with the skills, um, and I think we need to use them before they've all emigrated, because I do think we may have a problem in the future, because we do not have enough training going in for young apprentices with those skills that are going to be needed in construction. And when I was speaking on the private members, I mean, the rent supplement should never have been reduced first before there being a limit in whatever way that could be done on landlords as to the type of rents that they can impose. And we know now that we know now that there are landlords, they don't want rent allowance, and I mean that that is discriminatory. So uh, coming from that, those issues and those problems, looking at the bill and looking at the housing provisions bill, and I note the three key elements. There's a legislative basis for the new housing assistance payment, the new tenant purchase scheme for local authority tenants, and then the reform of the process for termination of tenancies. And I read your speech saying that you believe that this is going to bring about the most radical reform of public housing support. Um, but it's unfortunately not getting to the crux of the most serious problem, which is the lack of housing stock and opening up those voids. Now, on the termination of tenancies and repossessions, and you've listed on the basis of vacancy, squatting, antisocial behaviour, the death of a tenant or consistent failure to pay rents. Now, I'm in frequent contact with Dublin City Council Housing, and I do want to acknowledge my experience with them when it comes to people who get into arrears and their flexibility in coming to an arrangement with those tenants and working out a payment that is suitable and a payment that the tenant can keep up in order to clear those arrears. Now, I was part of the group at Dublin City Council who were looking at the antisocial behaviour and putting together the code and the protocol. And it was difficult because we've all got different ideas on what's antisocial behaviour. And I think sometimes it can depend on the age of the person as to what they consider is, is antisocial. But there's need for a speedy and a prompt and also a fair system where communities have been devastated because of antisocial behaviour particularly in drug dealing and in drug pushing. And I've seen too much of that, um, the devastation that that has caused, where it's not addressed as soon as it's brought to the attention of the authorities. 
With the local authority, they do have a process for dealing with tenants with antisocial behaviour. It may be a slow process, but it is there. And in the north inner city, we also have a very effective community policing forum who work directly between the community the local authority and the Gardaí and it's done in a confidential way and I do think it has been very proactive in preventing issues escalating. Um, this aspect of the bill is not getting at the private rental sector and again from my own experience in the constituency there are landlords who just do not care the type of tenant that they are putting into, <clears throat> into accommodation and they will not address the issues that are being brought to them about the behaviour of those tenants by other residents there. Now, on the repossession of the death of a tenant, because again, of coming across this, where grandparents have brought up grandchildren <clears throat> for a variety of reasons. The grandparents die. This has been the local authority accommodation for the child who's now an adult all of their lives. And now because of changing needs and circumstances, they are being moved from what was their home. And I, I do think that, that there should be some flex flexibility on that. Now, and then if a person is evicted, they're still, if they are a local authority tenant, they're still the responsibility responsibility of the local authority to house, so again it's creating a need for accommodation. Now the bill addresses landlord compliance in relation to accommodation standards and about the landlord being tax compliant and that the dwelling has to dwell or comply with standards. And we're told in it that the housing authority will inspect the accommodation themselves but if not before the tenancy then after the tenancy commences and I think that can be problematic because I believe that the inspection should be before um, the tenant moves in and I think there has to be a robust system for tenants on this that tenants are going into accommodation that is up to standard and I know that there have been appalling accommodation where tenants have have gone in and equally appalling state that they have left accommodation that was perfectly good when they did go in and I think we have to look at the responsibilities for both tenants and landlords we certainly don't want a return to the figures where last year over 90 percent of rented accommodation in Dublin didn't meet basic standards and where 75 percent of landlords in Dublin were splitting their houses into flats illegally and that brings me to the other aspect is again the need to make some provision for the subletting by tenants because again it's leading to overcrowding and health and safety issues so I firmly believe that we need a system in place with equal re uh, regard on rights and responsibilities of both the tenant and the landlord. It brings to another question there, I mean, how are the landlords going to be encouraged to join the scheme and place their property in the scheme when at this point in time we know they're doing their best to get out of schemes and they're not taking rent allowance or the RAS system. So how can it be ensured that landlords won't continue with the discrimination um, and not get involved in the HSAP? Now, I know that Social Protection, we're trying to get DAF.ie to take down the no rent allowance, but their point is, is that when, when the tenant is speaking with the landlord, they have to uh, answer if there is a rent allowance uh, being accepted. So there is a need to look at incentivising landlords to take part of the scheme and to accept the housing assistance payment. On the tenant purchase, I do think it's very positive in facilitating tenants become homeowners, those who can sustain a mortgage payment. And there's also positive factoring in the length of the tenancy in that new scheme. Now, on the housing assistant payment, <clears throat> again, coming back to this, it doesn't specify rent limits and setting the limits. And I think it could be problematic there as well. And I think there's a need for a review process to allow for changes in the rental market. So that you know, if the rent allowance is going to be subject to limits and HSP also subject to limits, that's accepted, but only if there's limits on the other side from the landlords. Um, you're saying that this assistance payment will be better all around for tenants, landlords and the local authority, but there is a massive question around the resources and the work, the extra work being expected of the local authority. And we know that they have been subject to cuts, they've been subject to, they've lost staff, so they're understaffed and they're under-resourced. So my question is how they will be able to cope with this. I think the bill is one thing and there's a lot of positives in it, but the essential problems of the rising rents, accommodation unfit for habitation, it will still continue. We need more robust legislation on that. And of course, the, the demand for housing not being met also. There's a concern for the housing charities in relation to the financing and a change from the 100% capital grant scheme to a loan financial regime. And finally, I was part of the Constitutional Convention and we made a recommendation at the end that the Constitution would be amended to include economic, social and cultural rights. And within that, that there was a specific right to housing. And I think if we could see that being moved and the government taking that on board, that is one thing. But of course, it's only getting it down on paper. We still have to have the resources to back up that right. Thank you.